uh, in this session, we'll hear, hear from the Dr. The, uh, Sam the Gailey, uh, who is the uh, population the health uh, postdoctoral post fellow, fellow in the Minnesota Population Center at the University of Minnesota. Uh, her research works uh, leverage the longitudinal and the geospatial data from population-based uh, registers to identify health uh, uh, disparities uh, arising from the unequal distribution of neighborhood resources. Her presentation today is titled Mobility-Based Green Space Exposure, Emotional Experiences and Gender Differences. She will share her findings on how exposure to green-blue space beyond the residential environment relates to the emotional experiences among people. Dr. Gilly. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. Before I get started, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Yangling Fan and the whole Dynamica team. I think this is a really unique event, um, and I'm really excited to share some of my Dynamica-based research with you. Um, so, as the as the uh, as we heard, this is a, a presentation um, on mobility-based green and blue space exposure, emotional experiences, and gender differences. This is work uh, I've collaborated with. Uh, Dr. Fan, as well as Huin Lee, Dr. Huin Lee at uh, the Ohio State University. Um, so yeah, go ahead and get started. Um, in recent years, research on green space, green space and health has really exploded. Um, we've seen exponential growth over the last few decades. Um, this is just a really simple search for the terms green space and health in Web of Science. We see here 1990 to 1999, two publications, two hits for those keywords. Over the last previous decade, 2010 to 2020, we see that number grow to 406 publications. I checked yesterday. Uh, since 2020, we've had another 204 publications just using these, these search terms. There are a number of reasons that uh, research on green space and health is experiencing a golden era. Um, I'm sure I can't document all of these different trends, but a few that stand out to me are, uh, first off, we're experiencing rapid global urbanization. In 1960, urban populations accounted for less than a third of the total global population. Today, it's about 50%, uh, expected to rise to nearly 70% by 2050. So people are moving to cities. They're, they're being cut off from, from rural, and rural environments. Second, uh, we're experiencing deforestation, climate change, all of these things that are further shrinking natural space even beyond cities. Um, a really not fun fact, there are 15 billion trees cut down annually. That doesn't even take into consideration uh, trees that are lost due to wildfires and other uh, manifestations of climate change. And third, most recently, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and attendant lockdowns, which have um, isolated large swaths of the population and really encouraged people to stay inside, uh, further disconnecting them from nature. So researchers, policymakers, uh, physicians have been watching these trends towards disconnection from nature. Um, as these trends have occurred, we also see rising psychiatric morbidities, we see rising chronic conditions like obesity, and that causes a lot of concern, of course. Uh, so you've seen the publication of lots of different books. Somebody, I've, I've been gifted the Nature Fix four times. Um, don't need any more Nature Fix. Uh, it, it's made people start to think, can nature actually really benefit health? And if so, what are we doing to conserve and propagate natural environments? So a quick overview, in case you haven't read the uh, you know, 202 publications since 2020. Um, there's good reason to believe that access to uh, natural environments, including green and blue spaces, can contribute to health. Uh, this is a, just a simple diagram showing a few of the main pathways through which green and blue space um, are potentially beneficial. First. Um, and this is the one that I'm going to kind of focus on today. Nature can operate as what's called a restorative environment. Um, basically, if you're, if you're stressed out, if you're feeling mentally fatigued, and you go, you know, you're directly uh, exposed to nature, you experience reductions in stress, you kind of have this uh, cognitive uplift, and you see shifts towards more positive emotions. Green space uh, and blue space can also operate as a behavior setting, um, of course, by encouraging physical activity. You also see greener areas are, uh, tend to be more socially connected. They kind of act as a, an activity space for social gatherings. 
And at the kind of highest level of analysis, um, you see that nature and uh, green and blue spaces can um, uh, confer ecosystem services. So these are things like the mitigation of air pollution. So as with any literature, this one is certainly not without its faults. Um, among the hundred or so articles that are published every year, an overwhelming majority focus on uh, what is classified as neighborhood green space. Um, there are a number of problems with definitions like this, which are typically delimited to um, spatial units like census tracts on the left, buffers on the right. I want to say I'm very guilty of both of these, I've used both of these in my own research, and I'm going to spend the next kind of 10 minutes talking about why they're not very good. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really moving forward, I think. And I also want to say my talk really pertains to green space, but the critiques that I'm about to leverage, I think, um, are relevant for various environmental exposures, both social and physical. All right, so some of the problems with uh, measuring green space in fixed aerial units like census tracts and buffers. First, these spatial units were never actually intended to meaningfully capture health-relevant rele health exposures. I mean, of course, that's not why census tracts were designed, so why do we think that we should use them um, when we're thinking about how nature, how green and blue spaces affect health? Uh, second, people living on the border of spatial units like census tracts are probably actually more exposed to uh, their neighboring environments. Uh, third, they assume that all residents in a given um, uh, census tract or other aerial unit are equally exposed regardless of their daily mobility patterns, which we've heard very substantially uh, by person to person as well as by different socio-demographic groups. Um, and lastly, and I think most critically, they very, very narrowly focus on the residential or home-based environment, despite the fact that people spend a substantial amount of time outside of their home environment. So taken together, I would say that you know, these, these kinds of popular measures, which again I use in my own research, are arbitrarily defined. They're uh, measured at the area level, which raises problems. They're assumptive of exposure, they're static, and they're home-based. So I think those last two, uh, those last two characteristics there, static and home-based, are probably the most problematic. And that's because it can give rise to uh, systematic exposure misclassification. Um, two reasons, for example, why, uh, why this uh, why this risk emerges. The first is, as I kind of just mentioned, people spend a lot of time outside of the residential environment. Uh, there's been work that estimates that up to 80% of time is spent uh, beyond one's perceived neighborhood. Um, so again, these kinds of measures, they're not classifying uh, other types of exposure. And second, uh, as Dr. Song very uh, well documented, we see a lot of differences in people's daily mobility, mobility patterns um, by uh, both person to person and along patterns uh, due to different types of identities like gender, um, as well as racial and ethnic identities among um, other characteristics. So taken together, this kind of raises the question, is neighborhood green space an ideologically meaningful characteristic? All right, I want to give one last example to illustrate this problem. Um, so I'm going to pick on my own research here. That map on the left is a choropleth of neighborhood green space. It's taken from um, a publication in Health in Place uh, maybe a year or two ago. I looked at relations between a residential green space and maternal um, uh, pre-pregnancy obesity. Um, so I want you to kind of use your imagination here. Uh, this is the most I've ever used shapes in a PowerPoint slide, so you know, please, please pay attention to it. But uh, imagine you're zooming into those kind of two neighboring tracks. You've got track one, which is a little bit greener, track two, a little bit less green. You've got two people, person A and person B, represented in gold and blue, respectively, uh, showing very different theoretical mobility patterns. Uh, person A travels to more unique locations. They're traveling further to work. Um, just in general, they have a larger spatial range, right, uh, compared to person B, who's kind of staying in that corner. Um, so we might think that person A, who is going to be estimated as having uh, limited access to green space or limited exposure to green space, is in fact probably much more exposed to green space than uh, that census tract level uh, measure would suggest because they're going into these greener areas. On the other hand, person B might in fact be less exposed to green space because they're staying in that kind of corner with limited green uh, or limited nature exposure. <clears throat> 
All right, so um, <laughs> I haven't, haven't actually gotten to the study yet, so, but I want to just recap on these, these differences in the measures because I think it's pretty important. Um, so most research on neighborhood green space uses these measures that are uh, area level, assumed, static, and home-based. Um, as such, researchers have started shifting towards, very slowly shifting towards uh, the use of GPS tracking. Um, and of course, Dynamica is one such measure. I'm not gonna go too much into it because I know that it's uh, been discussed a lot today and will continue to be discussed. Um, but in, in comparison to traditional measures, we see that Dynamica provides an individual level. Uh, it's capturing realized exposure to green and blue spaces. It's dynamic and it's mobility based. Okay, so the actual study. So we had two questions for this study. The first was, using this kind of uh, improved um, data collection method, does mobility-based exposure to green and blue space correspond with more positive emotional experiences during daily trips? Um, and then we wanted to look at whether differences potentially differ by gender for all of the reasons that Dr. Song mentioned earlier. Um, uh, people who identify as female or woman um, uh, have much smaller spatial range. You know, I I'm not going to go into all of the, the literature because we got a really great overview of that earlier. Uh, but as such, there's reason to suggest that their mobility-based exposures would be different. Um, so we, uh, or, well, I wasn't involved in the data collection, but I received this wonderful data in which participants used uh, Dynamica for about a week. Um, we measured as the outcome self-reported happiness. We also looked at a couple of other emotional experiences, but I'm going to focus on happiness. Uh, and we linked data on green and blue space uh, along travel routes. Um, so in, in these trips beyond, uh, both in and beyond the residential environment, I used fixed effects, uh, econometric models, I'm happy to talk more about those later, and I examined gender differences by stratifying the models and conducting uh, models with interaction terms. So just really quickly, descriptively, um, figure one there is showing mean route level happiness in green and blue space in the metropolitan area of the Twin Cities. There's a lot going on there. We're still working on this figure, but take my word for it. We observe, we observe happier routes are those that are closer to the lakes and the Mississippi River. You can kind of see the darker red is our happier, um, happier routes. And then on the right, this is again descriptive, but this is observing the gender gap in happiness by exposure to green and blue space. Um, so what we see here is with increasing level of exposure to green and blue space, we see that gender gaps start to narrow. It doesn't totally close, but this is suggestive of a protective or a positive association between green and blue space um, and uh, positive emotional experiences that potentially is stronger among women. And uh, that is what we observe in our, um, in our fixed effects models. Here we see, um, and I should say quickly, uh, we control for a lot of confounders. Fixed effects models also control for time invariant characteristics. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy to chat more on those model details later, but we do observe a positive association between mobility-based green and blue space exposure uh, and happiness uh, in the full sample, and that relation holds for females or those who identify as female, but not male. All right, so just to wrap up here, um, as I spent a long time talking about traditional measures of neighborhood green space like that which I've used previously, um, they predominate the literature, but they have a number of faults, um, potentially critical, uh, critical faults like um, that they can't capture differences in exposure by different socio-demographic groups, given that these different socio-demographic groups um, have different daily mobility patterns. Um, these types of measures potentially give rise to systematic exposure misclassification, which is why we need to continue, uh, both green space and health uh, researchers, but environmental researchers, I think, in general, need to continue to move towards these kinds of richer, more individualized measures of green and blue space exposure. Um, I'm really, uh, couldn't be happier to be able to use these kinds of measures. Um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, it opens up a lot of doors for what we can do in this kind of work. Um, and lastly, I'll just say, I think this um, kind of improved measures of exposure uh, is relevant for transportation policy and a number of other types of health policy, environmental policy that can help um, 
start to close the gender gap in uh, transportation experiences. All right, and that's all. Again, I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Swin Lee and Yingling Fan who uh, helped me with this work. Thank you.